posted on the uh, ESF uh, YouTube page at some point in the future. So um, I would like to welcome everyone to this evening's lecture with uh, Dr. David Charles Sloan from the University of Southern California. Um, and before we get started, I'd just like to ask everyone to mute themselves, stay muted. Um, if you have a question, um, feel free to type your question in the chat box. And then at the end of the lecture, we can take your questions. Um, and uh, I'd like to thank the Department of Landscape Architecture and I'd like to thank the uh, Image Communications and Events Committee. I'd like to thank the uh, Center for Cultural Landscape Preservation, of which I'm a member, and my colleagues, George Curry, John Allwater, also members, our student assistant, Carolyn Copenhaver, is with us. Um, and uh, just welcome all of you to our lecture series. There will be two more lectures uh, coming up in this series. One, the next one is April 8th called So Oakwood is Landmarked, What Does That Mean? And that will be with my colleague, John Allwater and myself. And then on May 6th, we will have our last lecture called What are the Guidelines for Preserving a Historic Cemetery Landscape? And that is also with John Allwater. So um, for a moment, I would like to introduce you all to uh, Timothy Webb Horvath, who is the president of our new student group, the ESF Friends of Oakwood. Thank you, Rachel. And thank you all so much for coming. Uh, so as a general introduction, this lecture series is being hosted by the ESF Friends of Oakwood. We are an on-campus student organization dedicated to maintaining the relationship between Oakwood Cemetery and ESF. Uh, as a part of this effort, we host weekly volunteering efforts in Oakwood Cemetery every Saturday from 1030 to 1.30 and have thus far accrued over 800 hours of service. Uh, we will be there this Saturday, so if you're a student and interested in coming, feel, please feel free to reach out. In addition, uh, we'll be having a meeting in two weeks from today at this time to host officer elections for the next year, so if you're a student, start thinking about that. And uh, with that, I'll give the spotlight back to Rachel to introduce the, our speaker of this evening. Thank you very much, Tim. And I do hope that you have a lot of new people signing up and joining uh, ESF Friends of Oakwood. I think our department chair is interested there. So you'll want to get in touch with Doug. I hear he's, uh, you're, you're good with the shovel, Doug. Is that correct? Yeah. So for tonight's lecture, I'd like to introduce our speaker, uh, David Charles Sloan. Dr. Sloan is a professor at the University of Southern California's Saul Price School of Public Policy, where he teaches courses in urban planning, policy and history, and community health planning and policy. His research examines the urban planning and public health uh, and American health disparities in community development, neighborhood dynamics of public safety and crime, and also public and private commemoration. Dr. Sloan currently is engaged in research projects regarding the role of resource environments in health disparities in cardiovascular disease and diabetes among African Americans, changing styles of commemoration in post Vietnam America, civil gang injunctions and public safety, and he's also involved in a social assessment of Hollywood, California. He authored The Last Great Necessity. Cemeteries and Planning, uh, Cemeteries in American History, which is excellent. And he co-authored Medicine Moves to the Mall, which also is excellent if you're interested in uh, that concept of um, urgent care clinics and all these little medical clinics uh, cropping up all over in strip malls. And I have to say that was where I first encountered Dr. Sloan. I heard him speak on that work at the 2004 five vernacular architecture forum conference in Tucson. And I was riveted by this topic. I thought it was fantastic. He also is the editor of Planning Los Angeles, as well as numerous articles and book chapters on a wide variety of topics. Um, he has been on the board of advisors uh, of the Journal of the American Planning Association and on the board of directors of the vernacular architecture forum. Uh, 
And he's also a member of our community here in Syracuse. Uh, he grew up inside Oakwood Cemetery right here, uh, immediately next door to us at ESF. And he's an alumnus of Syracuse University, earning his master's and his doctoral degrees in American history at the Maxwell Graduate School of Citizenship and Public Affairs. And tonight, Professor Sloan will speak on the uh, past and future life of cemeteries based upon his most recent book, Is the Cemetery Dead? Welcome, Dr. Sloan. Thank you very much. I appreciate you having me. It's been a really fun thing to sort of step back into a world uh, that I lived in for many years. Uh, and uh, it's intriguing to begin and go back. Uh, this is the entrance that we're going to talk about. That little arrow over there is tying to is sending you along a walkway that you're going to see again um, towards a house where I grew up uh, uh, from the time I came to Syracuse in 1953 um, to when it was torn down for uh, the construction of Route 81. And we're going to show you some of that stuff. Before we begin, uh, I'd like to do a land acknowledgement. Uh, this whole area is what, when I was young, known as the Iroquois Nation. Uh, and it's a remarkable thing. You know, I live in Los Angeles and we have a, a remarkable set of very vibrant realities. And, and when people ask me about it, I go, hey, I grew up in Syracuse and, uh, and Onondaga was part of our reality then and is now. Um, and as we all know, we should acknowledge that past. As Rachel suggested, I have two books on cemeteries. Uh, the Last Great Necessity was is a sort of standard history of, this, of the cemetery. Uh, the Is the Cemetery Dead book is much more of an attempt to sort of think about uh, what's happening to cemeteries after 40 years of thinking about cemeteries uh, and, and what are the, the issues for them, the challenges, and what else is happening around them. And so this lecture is really two or three pieces. The two big pieces are, I'm gonna talk about Oakwood and my experience in Oakwood. And then I'm gonna talk uh, as we move towards the end about the developments that are happening now that challenge Oakwood. And I'm gonna try and leave you with a little hope uh, for Oakwood because I think Oakwood uh, deserves hope. So it's hard to imagine that in 1859, a vast majority of the people that lived in Syracuse, New York, walked or rode behind a, a mile long parade to this space, Dedication Valley, which was the, as Elias W. Leavenworth, the new president of the new cemetery association said, the last great necessity of the city. We've taken care of industry, we've taken care of uh, people, now we have to take care of our dead and our memories. And if you walk down that, that, that street, if you go into this area, you really get a sense, not just of the landscape that they wanted you to experience, not just the artistic achievement they wanted you to experience, but the memory that they wanted you to experience. And all of them are part of this. Uh, and we'll talk about that as we move along. Oh, sorry. Uh, the Sloans have been doing this for a really long time. Uh, my father is Jack, grandfather is Frederick. He was superintendent of uh, the cemetery in Youngstown, Ohio, Todd Homestead. He was also assistant superintendent of Woodland Cemetery in Ironton, Ohio, which is where Nathan, his father was superintendent. And uh, Nathan's, Nathan's father-in-law was Ambrose Collier. From Jack, Greg was superintendent after my dad retired, and Stephen has stayed in the business. He was the assistant superintendent at Woodlawn Cemetery in New York City and is now uh, the superintendent of uh, Woodlawn Cemetery in Syracuse, New York. Uh, one reason I put this up is one, people are fascinated by the idea that I've been, my family's been doing this for a really long time. But the other is that cemetery superintendents, cemetery sextons, is one of those 19th century occupations that just went through down generations. 
just like many other occupations in the 19th century and the 20th century. We'll see if uh, this continues after Stephen, uh, it's not looking that great. So in re I was born in, in Todd, I was born in Youngstown, Ohio in 1953. My dad had been born in this house. I don't have a picture of the house where we moved to, so I'm showing you a picture of the house where my dad was born in Todd Homestead. Um, and then this is me being held by my mother uh, in May of 1953 with my older brother, Greg, on the right and my younger, my old, next oldest brother, Larry, on the left. Uh, it was, as you can imagine, an enormous change. My father went from being an assistant superintendent to his dad to being his own man. Um, and he tried to create a place that was he would that he would make the lot owners uh, who own the cemetery, it's a nonprofit association, would be uh, happy with. Now, Dr. George Curry went through this, so I'm not going to go through the history of the landscape uh, very carefully. Uh, Howard Daniels brilliantly, I think, uh, put together a plan, an early plan that that uh, allowed you to come into the cemetery. Uh, you'll notice there's no graves either to the right, the center or the left. Uh, this is a contemplative space, which was very important to this, if you will, a liminal contemplative space before you got to the burial grounds. Uh, you can see the, the office that was built in 1902, the greenhouse that was built at the same time and the older 1879 chapel, Silsby Chapel here that you'll see a couple pictures of. Um, when I came to the cemetery, the greenhouse, I think, I was pretty young, six weeks, but I think the, the greenhouse had just been torn down. It was right around there. It might've been right after we came. And that walkway I showed you is that little walkway right there uh, and then the front of the house was on this side and this was the house where I grew up. That dedication valley, you would go left up into this space up in here. You would move into this space. This is where the most famous monuments of Oakwood almost all are uh, from in the early days, the Sumner at the top, the Longstreet, the Leavenworth, et cetera, all the way along in there where they bought these enormous lots, you know, 20 lots, 40 lots, six, uh, 20 graves, 40 graves, 60 graves, uh, unlike what would happen later as we move along. Here's a little Davy uh, walking out of the house. There's the garage uh, from 1902, I think as well. Uh, and this to the right was my world. So I didn't go too far into the cemetery as a young man, later I would, but uh, in, the, in the early part, it was our house the railroad tracks, which was up on this berm, and then the area around my dad's office and these spaces where there were no graves. So we would go sledding there. We would we'd fight uh, indigenous populations. We would uh, be, be marshals and sheriffs, or we would do all sorts of stuff in this space. Once in a while, you would go in further, but this really was our backyard uh, to our house. There were two other spaces that were very important. This, you can see how that, that road curved to Oakwood Avenue. Uh, this was a really great, uh, really great uh, possibility for us right in here. Uh, it was beautiful trees. When I was like uh, nine, I got a new bicycle uh, without training wheels and I immediately uh, ran it right into one of these beautiful trees straight on, bang. Uh, on the other side of the road, uh, this side of the road, my dad actually built a little bit of a um, a little bit of a baseball field, so that we wouldn't play in a park down the road, down Oakwood Avenue, uh, because the police didn't think we should uh, in this in a in a little pocket park. Uh, we did, and so they, I got to come home a couple times in a police car. Oakwood, I, this is a aerial shot from 1926. And the one thing I wanted, to, you can see the entrance, the chapel, the greenhouse, the woods. You can get a sense of this, the enormity of the space. But the, really what I want you to take away from this is the number of trees. Oakwood was, and, it, and you know, it's gone through the elm disease where they cut down over 280 trees. It's gone through a series of really bad storms uh, that took almost a thousand trees, I believe. And, so it's been hard 
on the landscape in the in the years since this is taken. But Oakwood was a wooded place. Uh, it was intentionally a space where you were enveloped by nature. And I use that word quite intentionally. It wasn't where you entered and walked through. You really got in, in there and the city disappeared. The area around you, the cars disappeared, the, the houses disappeared, you were in this space. And this is the way that the great designers like Daniels imagine these new generation of cemeteries that were founded, starting with Mount Auburn in 1831 and, and continuing into the 1870s when a new uh, style really takes over. Uh, it, you couldn't go anywhere. There were just uh, does hundreds of varieties of trees, but the two trees that dominated the landscape were the elm and the oak, uh, and they were just about everywhere. So what was this cemetery like? Uh, it was a place of beauty. It was a place of emotion. It was a place of landscape. It was a place of emotion. It didn't matter where you went, you ran into th monuments like this Denison monument with the young man looking up towards a figure. Uh, the death dates of the children in this family are on the back of the monument. Uh, it was a it was a time of, of great uh, very high death rates among children and among mothers, and so grief was present in this space this 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 dedication valley. Now I'm going to take you through from the 1830s when Mount Auburn is established into the 1930s in this first piece, and uh, the three things that are big really big things that are going to happen is that in the early days, grief is a home-based grief. So you died at home, you were laid out at home, you had your, uh, more, you had your uh, wake at home, take to the, you got taken to the, to the church or the synagogue or the, ma the mosque and you were, were, uh, were sent to heaven and then you came back to the cemetery. Gradually, we're gonna see that be medicalized over this period, moving from the home to the hospital. The second is, in this early period, death is very much part of the family life. So you might clip uh, uh, some hair from the person who's just died and mount that in your living room. Uh, it, you might put in a little shrine, there's all sorts of things. We're gonna move from that to a very different kind of attitudes towards death. And as you can see with the Denison and you'll see with a few others, commemoration was incredibly elaborate and it would gradually be privatized, standardized and simplified. And that is the move through which we're gonna go. So essentially the history is built of death and dying and, uh, and commemoration is really built around this trend. So in the 19th century cemeteries were for, I'm sorry, hospitals were for poor people. If you were middle-class, the doctor came to you. By the early 20th century, you went to the hospital. There was a whole set of new technologies, the x-rays, et cetera, which the surgeries, the anesthesias that would allow you to do that. You moved instead from your home to a funeral home. And funeral homes really became prevalent after the Civil War and then exploded in numbers in the latter part of the 19th century. You moved from there to chapels or churches or synagogues or mosques. You move to some place. Cemeteries in the very beginning, the Mount Auburns didn't immediately build chapels, but then they did build chapels, which were quite busy and uh, became an essential part of the landscape itself. And this, of course, is the great Silsby Chapel in Oakwood, um, which is now um, a mess. But uh, I can tell you, I was there in the 60s and it was just a spectacular space. And then of course you went to the cemeteries. The interesting thing is if you, if you talk to most professionals, historians, you know, they talk about the hospital, they talk about the funeral home, but it's really the cemetery that starts this. It is the Mount Auburns, the Oakwoods, it's the Greenwoods, it's, it's the Spring Groves. This is the place where we really begin to move the dead from in the city, in the, in the right, in the middle of the city outwards to the periphery like Oakwood was moved uh, in the 1859. So 
Oakwood is formed in 1859. And what I'm going to talk about is the period essentially between 1859 and the 1970s, with a little hint to the last part. And uh, this was me with my parents in 1959, when the Centennial Memorial was dedicated on top of the hill, uh, not on the bottom, but on the top of the hill. And as you can see, the graves around it had already begun to uh, had we're not there. You can see in the picture there all these graves that you see behind me in 2016 are not there. This is my dad's big uh, expansion of the cemetery through the woods up to the top of the hill and then really building out. One of the reasons for this was by the 50s, this, this, this idea that you wanted to be enveloped in the cemetery had begun to slip away. The dead weren't part of the household anymore. The dead weren't part of how we thought about the household. Now the dead were dying, were in the hospital. The dead were in the funeral home. And so America becomes less comfortable with death starting uh, in the as early as the 19 teens, but really by the middle of the century. So my dad built this area because you could get off of Colvin Avenue, come quickly up the hill and be at your burial site. You didn't have to go through the cemetery, through that extraordinarily wonderful valley into the cemetery anymore. You had to uh, imagine yourself in a different way. Now this is 1959, not 1969. And we're gonna talk about, there's an enormous change that's about to happen to the cemetery. And, and by now my dad is already negotiating with the state about that change. So what were the grounds like? The grounds were unbelievable as a kid, I have to tell you. It was a remarkable place to grow up uh, because there was all sorts of things that you could play with, you could learn about, you could experience. Uh, those of, a, of you who are old enough, uh, like me, might remember that the 4th of July, per, the, the, sorry, the Memorial Day parade in Syracuse, New York, started downtown, wended its way, its way up through the gate at Oakwood and ended at this space uh, in the top left, the, the Civil War burial section uh, that has been there for many, many years. Uh, and I can tell you as a kid, riding on the cannons and shooting them play ways was really a fun thing to do. I will, one of the most uh, memorable moments of my young life was actually happened right in front of this. Uh, there was a bunch of people giving speeches and there was uh, lots of people and there was this older man with a cane and my mom came over and put her hand around me and pointed to this man and said, that man was a drummer boy in the civil war. Now I'm an historian. I. I don't know when I became an historian, but my mom says that was one of the moments in which I realized history isn't something that is past. History is part of our lives. We are in history now, and we have been part of that history. And so I never forgot seeing this wizened old guy and imagine him on the battlefield at Gettysburg. I never got to meet him, but uh, he was there. The cemetery is filled with beautiful statues uh, uh, and, and especially female sculptures. Uh, there are dozens of them, uh, particularly in the older sections, but uh, around. And what happened was that the cemetery is a place of great emotion and sadness. So I, I'm gonna talk about how much fun I had there, but I don't want you to get the misinterpretation that somehow I saw this, especially as I got older, as a place that was my fun park. I was well aware by the time I was 13 or 14 or 15 of the sadness that surrounded these, the, these grounds. Uh, the, the beauty of the Nevin Angel, the extraordinary uh, stone to Laura Baldwin. Uh, and I put give you the quote that the first time I read it, I knew I would never forget it. As a teenager, uh, in less than one revolving year, she was a maid a bride, a corpse. And you can find these kinds of moments of sadness throughout the cemetery. Uh, there's, they're, they're just everywhere in this older space because the monuments themselves, this one with two willows and urns, 
an older style uh, where the monuments themselves were intended to express this emotion and be part of it. So I went to work for my dad when I was 13. Uh, in the state of New York, you can't, uh, you can't handle motorized uh, machinery when you're 13. So he gave me a hedge clipper, a wheelbarrow, and a rake. And he put me at the far edge of Morningside Cemetery, which by then was already under uh, Oakwood management. And he said, clip all the bushes, then move to the next section, clip all the bushes, and then move to the next section and go all the way across the cemetery. And when you get done, turn around and go the other way. So I did that for two years, three years. And then in, in, when I was 16, I was given this two horsepower uh, mower to run. And in that period, I sort of became part of the crew of these uh, guys, all guys uh, who worked there. And they were really amazing people, really great to the little kid. Uh, and we had our moments where we didn't agree, but it was really great. Uh, and then when I got to be a little older, when I got to be 17, 18, 19, 20, and I came back every summer and worked in the cemetery, then my dad uh, let me uh, have more of a role in the cemetery. And I began to appreciate the way it worked as a place of sadness and grief. Um, so here you get to see one of the most beautiful monuments uh, in, the, in the cemetery, uh, the Granger family uh, structure uh, down by the railroad tracks. And then, you know, nature is an important part of the landscape in many ways. So the Krauss boulder here, the trees that surround it, the land, the lawns, the bushes, the, there was all sorts of ways that the landscape was shaped. Uh, and it is shaped, it's not a natural landscape, it's a constructed landscape by first Howard Daniels, then the superintendents that came be, uh, after him to build and develop the, the place that it was. The Colvin uh, stump tree is a classic example of what this was like. And, as a kid, you begin to realize that everything on one of these monuments meant something, that there's a language that most of us have no access to about what is the stump, why is the, why is it, why is the tree cut off? Well, it's because it represents a life that wasn't lived to its maturity. It's actually literally a symbolic representation of a, an early death. The, 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 the ivy and the other things on the other uh, grow, natural things on the tree stump uh, are about loyalty and love and tradition. And they, each, each floral element had its own meaning to this generations of uh, people who built these and constructed or erected these monuments. I give you an example. This is my family plot in Woodlawn Cemetery where my dad and mom are buried. And this is what's going to happen now, is that that language is going to be turned, in, it's going to be turned away from, and we're going to simplify and standardize the monuments. Now you can see the vestiges of it behind my, my family's bench, the cross from across is in the, in that beautiful little movement, uh, little angel that's on the far right. But it's not this, these are all standardized uh, monuments that you can buy off the rack in a monument uh, store anywhere in the United States. And it becomes a very different landscape because of that, I think. The loss of that language, I think is a particularly great loss to Oakwood and the cemeteries of the day. Of course, this then leads to, by the 50s and 60s, to these swaths of uh, very similar granite monuments. Some of them are rose quartz. Uh, a few of them are still marble, but the vast majority of them are granite because it's hardier, it's easier to cut, it's cheaper to get. Um, and so they begin to proliferate all, the, all over the place. Now, don't misunderstand me. I spent a lot of time in both these sections and I love them, they're beautiful. But it doesn't have the vibrancy culturally that the older sections had. And one of the things I'm gonna talk about 
uh, near the end of this is how we've gotten back some of that vibrancy as we've moved forward and done things. So gradually I moved from my mower um, to driving a truck. Uh, I couldn't drive a truck on the city streets because I didn't have a driver's license, but I could drive in the cemetery and I got my own crew, which was really great. And we would go around uh, summer after summer and fill uh, gra sunken graves all over the old section of the cemetery. Uh, almost everybody, you know, natural burial is now a very big deal. Uh, before 1870, almost everybody in Oakwood is buried naturally. They're put into a pine box, they're not embalmed, they're uh, put into a pine box and buried. And so, so at some point that pine box collapses and the grave leaves a, 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 a space that needs to be filled by some young guy who's got a bunch of dirt on the back of his truck. The other part of this job though was one of the saddest parts of my job. My dad had a lot of faith in me as a young man. And so he would ask me to um, bury the little babies. And there were not the number of babies that there would have been in 1910, but by, and you were talking now in the late 60s, early 70s, but there were a number of preemies, uh, early deaths. And so they would come in these little white caskets and I would put it on the back of my truck and I would drive to a spot uh, near the elk actually. Uh, and I would dig the hole and many times no one would come and it would be really simple. I'd dig the hole, I'd say a prayer and I'd cover it up. And sometimes the fam, you know, the parents would come and I would uh, hold a little service for them. Uh, as, and, and it was uh, a moment where you realize the power of death and grief and the power of the cemetery as a place of memory and meaning to the people who were there. Uh, it really began to teach me about the cemetery. So then everything changes in my life. Uh, this drawing is that change. In 1955, uh, Syracuse agrees, uh, at least tentatively, they fight about it for another few years, to uh, in an interstate highway plan for Syracuse. And it goes right down by the cemetery. Indeed, it went right through my house. Uh, the house that I lived in is right here, uh, right on the outside of the gate and literally the freeway, the highway, sorry, I'm from California now, the, free, the highway uh, went through the front door of my house. It meant that we had to move. We had to move away from this. And so personally, it was an enormous change. I went from Danforth High School to uh, elementary school to Ed Smith. Uh, I went from uh, a, a school that was about a third to 40% probably African-American to Ed Smith where there was a very small number of African-Americans. Uh, I went from a school that was viewed as a ghetto school. So I was a really smart kid there to Ed Smith where I was really not a smart kid. And so it was really a big change for me personally. For the seventh cemetery though, it was, oh, sorry. I put this in to give you a sense. This is actually a map from 2010. So I'm not trying to argue this. Uh, up here is the 15th Ward, which was almost entirely obliterated, the, uh, the a traditional African-American community in Syracuse. And so most people moved south and west into this area, south of South Syracuse. And of course, Oakwood is right here in the freeway. The highway went right by it and changed everything. We moved, second move in my life. I said it was 1964. I was just told that I might be a little late here. I remember it being 64 because I was in fifth grade uh, in, in, Dan, in Danforth. And I was, so that would, and that's when Kennedy got killed. And uh, that's 1963, I guess, it's 60, 63. And we moved and I started school the next year. So maybe it was 63 that we moved. This was the new house we moved into on the other side on Comstock. Comstock becomes the major entrance to the cemetery. Um, and of course, what this really means, if you look at this map, I don't want you to think of it as a straight line. I want you to think of it as a flip, literally flip the map. So the whole organization of the cemetery, the chapel, the office, the entrance, where the funerals came in, where the burials were, was in the old cemetery down where it says you are here. In the new cemetery, 
the new time in the cemetery, all that gets moved to the other side of the cemetery. It takes a long time, doesn't happen right away. The office and the chapel remain in operation for a decade, uh, more than a decade after the, the closing of the gate. But it's pretty clear pretty quickly to my dad uh, and the, the board that things have changed. Uh, and of course, this is the cemetery gate taken by me in 2016. I hear it's been heavily graffitied since then. Uh, but what it really meant was that Oakwood sort of lost its identity. Um, this gate, this, this arch, the, the office was really its identity as a cultural landscape. Uh, and now it had to rebuild that, that and it, it was a, a real challenge for them to do it. For me and for my family, it really was an enormous reorientation. And so my uh, Aunt Mill and Uncle Jim would come to visit us and Uncle Jim would decide, oh, I'm gonna go see Cornelius. And by that he meant Lyman Cornelius Smith's uh, mausoleum, which is just off the, the entrance to the, on Comstock. If you've never been to, to Oakwood and you've never been to the Smith Mausoleum, it is one of the first places I would go because it has one of the most spectacular Tiffany uh, pieces in its back of any mausoleum I've ever been in. And I've been in well over 150 cemeteries. Uh, it also was a place where you could see a difference uh, in the monuments, so the Chapin columns, the, the classical becomes much more prevalent if you move towards Comstock. Uh, the Art Deco, Art Nouveau also becomes much more prevalent. This is the, the gate, uh, gate to the, to the, to the uh, Krauss Mausoleum. Uh, it's a big change sort of physically. It's a change aesthetically. You'll notice around the Chapin, uh, Chapin columns, there's no, there's no obvious graves, no obvious stuff. Uh, and so it, there was a big change, but there were huge casualties. And the major casualties, of course, as uh, ESF and uh, the students are, and the HACVA are trying to, to work on, the big casualties were the office and the chapel. Uh, I can remember so many experiences in each of these places that when I went back in 2016, it was just painful for me. You know, my dad's office was on the right here. We would run in, hang out with him. Uh, the secretaries uh, and the assistants sat on the other side and they would let us play with their typewriters and other, and all the file cards that had all the records. The chapel um, was a place where we would go in and hang out and, 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 and spend time with my father. It was also the place that we uh, viewed as our bomb shelter uh, during the nuclear uh, crises uh, in Cuba and in other times. Uh, Jack had given us explicit directions. You know, when you come home, if this is happening, go directly to the chapel and we'll go down into the basement of the chapel. And so to see them forlorn, lost, if you will, is very difficult for me. So all of this is happening to me uh, and to Oakwood. There's also a whole bunch of other stuff going on. And this is what is the cemetery is really about, is that in the last half of the 20th century, just like in the last half of the 19th century, death begins to change dramatically. One of the, I've given you three here. I'm gonna talk about two of these. I'm not gonna talk about digital media. I'm happy to answer questions about it. But uh, two of these are, in the latter part of the 20th century, the environmental sensibility that leads to all sorts of legislation and activities and organizations uh, affects how we see the cemetery. And then commemoration becomes more public. And we'll talk about that. The big change though was cremation. Uh, you can see here, I came to New York, to Syracuse, New York before 1960. And in 1960, almost nobody got cremated. It was a really marginal part of the death industry. Uh, and it stayed that way for a really long time. Uh, you'll notice that it, even in, in 2000, it's just around a quarter of deaths are cremated. 
Uh, you will also see that by in the last 20 years, it's skyrocketed and become a really big deal. Uh, now we are we're actually in an age where there are more cremations there there are interments in the United States. People often tell me this is about price, and I look at them and say, well, it was cheap in 1960, 1980, 1990, 2000, 2010. Why is it now so prevalent? It's about culture. It's not just about price. And one of the parts of that culture is this separation of families, generations from the cemetery. Now it's not happening everywhere, uh, but it is happening everywhere. So you can see this chart from 2015 and you'll see that this 19% in Mississippi, and that seems like really small compared to Nevada, uh, uh, sorry, to Nevada or Oregon in their 70s or even now in the 80s. But if you were to go back a decade in Mississippi, you'd find that this is doubled between 2005 and 2015. And so even in places that have been very resistant, cremation is becoming more and more important. And cremation changes everything. So if you have a person who's in a casket, you have to have a cemetery. You have to, it's the law. If you have a cremation, you can do anything with it you want. It's a final disposition legally. And so the family takes control of the body through cremation and that really changes the world. So I thought I would ask, Rachel said she would add up the answers. Uh, how many of you out there listening today are gonna be buried or entombed in a cemetery? How many of you are gonna be cremated and interred in a cemetery? And how many of you are gonna be cremated or uh, recompost or bio, uh, yeah, there's all sorts of things that we can talk about, but you're not gonna use a cemetery. So you can put A, B, and C in the, in the chat, or the, I, I, probably the chat's the best place. And while you're doing that, I'm gonna keep going. So first is you're gonna be buried in term cemetery. Second B is cremated and still going to the cemetery. C is I'm gonna be cremated, I don't need a cemetery. So you do that and I'll keep going while you do that. Because what is happening is while this happens, right? While this, this cremation stuff is happening, all sorts of other stuff is happening. And you know about most of them. I'm going to talk about them, but I think most of them are uh, things that you know about. The first is the rise of natural burying grounds, the rejection of embalming, the address of pesticides, etc. Second is what I call everyday memorials. Other people call them spontaneous shrines. There's all sorts of names for them. The third is these virtual cemeteries, which again, I'm happy to answer questions about. And the fourth is this environmental sensibility, which is natural burial grounds, biocremation, promission, and recomposition. For those of you who are behind in your language, uh, recomposition is the new name of human composting. Uh, and so uh, we're gonna just move quickly through this. So in the last 50 years, don't die in a hospital, die at home. And the uh, home death has become a big deal. Or if you can't pull that off, die in a hospice. And that has become uh, very different. Be cremated, have your memorial service wherever you wish to have it. You can have it in a chapel, you can have it in a church, or you can have it in a rec center, you can have it in the backyard, you can have it in a park. Um, and you can, Mourn your fellows on social media, on virtual cemeteries, in all sorts of places. And then you can scatter the ashes. You can be buried in a natural burial ground, or you can be uh, composted only in the state of Washington so far, although there's activities uh, uh, around legislation in California and other places around the country. I put in the turtle purposefully because scattering ashes in uh, lakes and in oceans is very popular. Um, and people have continuously had problems with this where they throw the ashes out and the ashes come back. Uh, and so people have come up with ways, this is a soluble turtle, you put the ashes in the, in the innards of it and it de decomposes into the water and you don't have to worry about ashes coming back to you. <clears throat> and so that, that's the transfer, that's the big transformation. The rest of the transformation is really about changes. 
in the way we think about where we can mourn. So here we have a man in Montmartre Cemetery in Paris mourning his loved ones. Here we have the, the, the Facebook page of my sister's wife who passed away from breast cancer, still active, still receiving birth, uh, birthday congratulations uh, from friends and neighbors. And here we have the ubiquitous roadside shrine. This one outside of Syracuse as Chris and I, uh, Leslie's wife, Chris, my sister, were driving to Thanksgiving. We saw this uh, just as we were driving out in from Rochester. This is an enormous change because in the middle of the 20th century, you, would, you did not memorialize in public. It all became more and more private. Uh, you know, it, it even got to the point where uh, parents were strongly urged not to bring their children to a funeral, that this was an uh, adult activity and should be done in private and then take your privacy, your, your morning home. And this is breaking down. It's breaking down in lots of different ways. We see it in the memorial uh, decals uh, on the back of trucks and cars. We see it in the roadside shrines that have now uh, gotten away from the roadside. This is in Echo Park in Los Angeles where I lived. A young man was killed in the, and died in the lake. It is, it's in uh, the streets and on stores. Here's a RIP mural in New York City, the Lower East Side. It's uh, official, but still in public. This is uh, one of, the, one of the, the plaques that were put out in Buenos Aires to places where people were disappeared in the 1970s and 80s by the military or the militias down there and, and died. And it's very present today. So this is a beautiful memorial that was done around COVID in Detroit on Belle Isle, where they printed out these large format pictures of photographs of people who had died. And then they literally had a funeral procession along this space uh, and allowed people to go. So how do cemeteries deal with this? One, they have to embrace cremation. They got to get, they got to, they got to decide that they can do scattering gardens. They got to decide they can do green burial sections. And many, many, many of them are. They have to reclaim their natural heritage. And this is from Hakba. This is, you know, the, their efforts to rebirth the chestnut. Um, I am one of those people who had chestnut fights because there were so many chestnuts in Oakwood when I was a child. And I still actually have a couple hanging around uh, that I kept as memorials to me at my life. They have to bring back emotion. And so you have to personalize. Up in the left is my family uh, gravestone from Youngstown, Ohio, Todd Homestead to my grandfather and great grandmother. Um, and when this, uh, when the Chris, Christfield uh, monument appeared in Morningside uh, with the golfer, <clears throat> This is quite a long time ago. My dad was like appalled. He just thought it was the weirdest thing. Now in Oakwood, you can find the speedboat on the, right up from the chapel. And uh, going a little bit further, you can find the, the bus to heaven. Uh, and you can find a lot of these in Whitechapel and other places that are connected to Oakwood. So this idea of personalizing morning, my dad came to visit me in uh, 2000, two years before he passed away. And I took him to, he came for Christmas. So I took him to Culver City to one of my favorite cemeteries in, in Los Angeles. And there he got out of the car and he just shook his head. He just shook his head because of course the whole section is now a Christmas tree. And it happens at Easter, it happens at Halloween, it happens all the time. But personalizing mourning is part of the deal. You have to begin to rethink this. One of the ways that places in Los Angeles and now beginning across the country have started to do this is to in integrate ethnic holidays, integrate ethnic celebrations into the cemetery, the traditional Protestant uh, nonprofit cemetery. So this is a Day of the Dead celebration at Hollywood Forever uh, Cemetery in Los Angeles. Uh, they, have, they had 33 of these altars that you could walk by. Uh, it was $35 a head. They had somewhere around 20,000 people during the time it was up. Income, and income for older cemeteries is an essential idea. So thinking about that kind of thing. And then 
uh, trying to use the art of today, contemporary art, to, to integrate it back into the cemetery. Here on the right, uh, Sof Sophie Kella in Greenwood, uh, sorry, in the bottom, Sophie Kella in Greenwood and Christopher Frost in Forest Hills in Boston, uh, using the spaces. Greenwood Cemetery, if you're interested in art and cemeteries, contemporary art and cemeteries, Greenwood Cemetery is doing fantastic stuff. Uh, and I would encourage you to look at it. And then finally, cemeteries have long been part of the public realm. But when I was growing up, increasingly cemeteries were outside that public realm. Uh, there were fewer and fewer people who visited. There were fewer and fewer events. Eventually, the Memorial Day parade ends, doesn't come to Oakwood anymore, uh, especially after the gate is closed. It's now completely stopped. Uh, and so one of the things that uh, I think cemeteries need to think about is how do you bring people back in? And one way was Forest Lawn Memorial Park in the 1940s, and they still do it, is an Easter Sunday service. In the 40s and 50s, they would, uh, they would get 40 or 50,000 people. Here is Hollywood Forever again. And this is their big mausoleum. And they show movies on it during the summer and uh, sell tickets, two or 3,000 tickets uh, uh, a screening. Now, this may sound, oh my god, he's from Los Angeles. He's crazy. They're crazy. Everybody's crazy. Well, Mount Auburn, the, the, the godfather of all of this, uh, is doing this now. And so I think we're going to see more and more ways that this can happen. So this is just a summary cremation. Cemeteries have to com compete with public memorials. Uh, they got to start thinking about natural burial grounds. Uh, they have to use their open space for their public uses. They got to believe in their art, in their history, in their ethnic diversity. Uh, and then they have to get ready for change. The last one is one which is not true of many cemeteries. I talk about this in the book. You know, Syracuse University has a very active set of schools that do humanizing services around counseling, psychology, social work, other things. Cemeteries could be a place for that to happen, not just a place separated from that by a hedge. Finally, a hope. Uh, going down by the old gate is just so sad for me. Uh, it's, it's devastating. And as you know, there's a movement in Syracuse to bring that awful highway down and to reinstitute a boulevard. Uh, and uh, and uh, Sabrina from SUNY ESF uh, has, has done these drawings about what this could look like. I'd like to make a tiny tweak on this drawing. I think that would make a really great natural burial section. And I think it could be really beautiful. And I think it could be really desirable to people who want to bury naturally in Syracuse and surrounding areas. Thank you for listening. I'm happy to answer some questions. Thank you very much. That was really, really interesting, very thought provoking. And I appreciate also that you uh, brought in Sabrina's project at the end. It was very interesting to watch her work on that project. So um, if you want, do you want to know the results of this poll? I do, I do. I to tell you that, that not everybody participated, but among those who participated, we had um, eight people choosing A. So A is, again, can you in remind? In the cemetery. Burying in the cemetery, traditional burial. We had 18 people choosing B, which is? Which is uh, in, cremation and then burial and in interment in the cemetery. And then we had 22 people choosing C. Which is uh, cremated out, or, or recomposition, whatever, outside the cemetery. And then I have we, to uh, just, oh, go ahead. I'm just going to say, and then we had a couple of write-ins of people who just had not made up their minds. They yeah. were between A or B or B or C, and one person who explicitly said, I would like a natural burial. Yes. And I uh, was going to go back and add natural burial, but time is time. Um, those results, though, are indicative. Mm -hmm. 
it, you know, cemeteries make an enormous profit off of a traditional burial. They make a considerably less profit off of a cremation burial. Mm -hmm. And so you have to figure out. Now, places like Mount Auburn have built incredibly elaborate, very expensive places to put cremains, um, but it's not that the, the basic uh, financial reality of cemeteries is very hard if you're not going to have people be traditional burials. Um, can you say something or do you do you know when uh, cemeteries went to this model of so-called perpetual care? Because that seems to be something that, you know, isn't necessarily financially tenable. Well, it is if you keep it. <laughs> See, one of the problems with most uh, middle, what I would call middle class cemeteries. So, you know, Mount Auburn has like $60 million in the bank or $800 million in the bank at this time, point, probably. Uh, so does Green, Greenwood has a healthy endowment. So does Spring Grove. So does Forest Lawn. They're the top of the pops and they have a bunch of money. But the middle class often had to dip into their money, especially in the late 70s when inflation went crazy. And as inflation costs came in, uh, labor costs, machinery costs, uh, everything became too, so expensive that they could not raise their prices fast enough mm -hmm. to match the, uh, they couldn't raise their prices fast enough, period, but they couldn't raise their, they, they couldn't raise enough money. So they dipped into their endowments. Uh, some uh, just took the whole thing um, and some, uh, dipped in and have something, but they don't have enough. Mm -hmm. uh, and so perpetual care was a really good idea. It goes way back. They realized pretty quickly that uh, if you're going to have a long street pyramid, you better have some money to take care of it. Uh, and so they asked for endowments initially on big uh, mo monuments and mausoleums. But then they began to realize, oh, yeah, you got to cut the grass everywhere. And so they began to do annual care. So that was really the beginning was annual care. And they would ask you to pay a very small amount every year to support the grounds maintenance. People got tired of that pretty quickly and said, could I just pay this off? And so that's when we got perpetual care. Okay, thank you. So the first question that somebody asked was really a, just a question about location, which is that beautiful tree stump that you showed, the Colvin tree stump. W do you know where in the cemetery that's like, located? I can't give you the exact spot, but if you go in the old, set, if, so if you take that left and you go up, up through Dedication Valley and you go, keep going up, you keep going up, it's right in there. It's right, ab it's sort of right above Dedication Valley. Uh, on, one of the northern sections. Okay. So okay. you know, east east is Comstock, west is is Route 81, south is Colvin, north is is Syracuse University. It's not on the sections along Syracuse University. It's in one, I think, uh, but it's right in there, and it's a nice walk. Beautiful trees. Somebody has asked, um, did you ever see the original crypt opposite the chapel on Midland? The bricks are beginning to show in the hill. Do you remember it? No, I don't remember it. No. I mean, I knew it was there, but I don't remember ever uh, seeing it in, in its uh, original form. Once they built the, 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 the chapel, um, everything else sort of went by the wayside. Because the chapel had a very substantial space for bear, for for uh, bodies, I don't know how many it is, but it's it's got to be at least twenty or forty. Mm -hmm. So they really didn't need anywhere else. So when the when you were a kid, do you remember if the ground was quite frozen? I mean, were they able to to um, have funerals or 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 bury folks in 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 winter? So starting in the forties, I think it is maybe as early as the twenties, they had mechanical backhoes. And mechanical backhoes can get through uh, not super frost. So there were some weeks where Jack would say, we're not burying anybody this week. We'll have the funeral. We'll put the body in the chapel and we'll wait. But most of the time you could bury uh, with, uh, with, with the backhoe. The trick was there were specific places near actually the Colvin. There's, you come down and there's this little valley. And there are graves on both sides of that little valley. And I can tell you there are because I dug one. 
because the backhoe could not go up there. It would have fallen over. So a friend of mine who worked with me, David Feld, and I spent a day digging a grave on the side of this hill. And it wasn't that that place is totally covered in trees. And so that, you know, we must have hit like 90 uh, roots as we went down. Wow. Wow. And so it wasn't easy. Um, someone has asked if Oakwood, if you recall, if Oakwood was financially viable when you were growing up there. Um, oh. did have an endowment that was lost. Uh, so it had some endowment. I, you know, I was a kid, so I don't know how much, mm -hmm. but uh, it was financially viable because it had a regular stream of burials. The burials were really what kept the cemetery going. Mm -hmm. uh, then Jack did a couple of things. One, he contracted out with the Jewish cemeteries in the 70s and, and managed the Jewish cemeteries for a number of years. And that was a fairly substantial amount of money, which helped support. And then of course they added um, Whitechapel, which was intended to be a revenue source that would support the Morningside Oakwood part of the family. But I don't remember, I don't know how, how big the endowment was, how substantial, if it was substantial or not. I know they were already having trouble with a lot of gravestones being tipped over or just struggling in the winter. And so there was a heavy cost to the maintenance of the old section. So somebody has asked if you uh, can recall where you might find some rose quartz um, monuments. Uh, are they sort of scattered or? Um, uh, they are scattered. Uh, you know, you can't really do it anymore. There's very little rose, real rose quartz left in the world. Um, I think if you go, um, that shot I showed of going down the hill on, I think, it, what is it? Sorry, the memory is not that good. I think it's 70, from the top of the hill, 76, I think goes down okay. uh, to the valley. Uh, I think if you go there, there's a couple, maybe on top or down. So Rose Quartz really became super popular. Uh, it became popular, really, mm -hmm. in the post-war period. It, I mean, there's a few earlier ones, but there's not really a lot, I don't think. It's really a 50s, 60s, 70s thing. And so look to those sections, and you'll find them. Okay. It was popular for a while. There were really nice examples. Most of it was very rough. They didn't, they didn't. And then a few people really polished it. Okay. Um, somebody has asked if you might know how many other cemeteries have a cremation uh, operation like Oakwood, which provides a separate significant income stream augmenting interments or other income sources. Uh, I don't know how many cemeteries in Syracuse have a crematory. I do know one other one, and that's run by a guy named Stephen Sloan. Uh, and Woodlawn added a crematory, I think, two years ago. Uh, and is, is, uh, he actually was on the news. I don't know if anybody saw him, but uh, they were accepting bodies uh, to be cremated from New York during the, uh, during the COVID. Yeah. Uh, and I don't know whether Oakwood was doing that, but I know Stephen has been very involved with the New York State Cemetery Association. So he has a lot of connections in New York that I'm not sure the superintendents of Oakwood, I don't, I'm not connected with them anymore. Um, so uh, your friend, David Feld, <laughs> would like, Feld. He'd like to know who was your best summer worker in the summer of 1972. <laughs> and it was David Feld who has been my best friend since uh, we met at Levy Junior High School in 1966. <laughs> wow. He's now a retired public defender in Oakland, California. And there he is, right there. I find, I I find it really interesting that, so uh, it's Hollywood Forever, is that what it's called? Yes. It's, showing, it's showing these movies on the yeah. back of that building and I can't, picture a place in Oakwood where there would be a big blank surface or but what other kinds of cultural activities they do walking tours ghost tours things like that but um what other 
kinds of um, artistic or cultural events could you imagine? It's interesting to me that you mentioned Greenwood because there was an article I read just today in the New York Times about a Japanese dancer, a modern dancer who gave a dance performance in Greenwood and the photographs, it looked very beautiful. Uh, Moylan's done, Rich Moylan's done a great, uh, just a fantastic job as, you know, he's been there He's actually thanked in the last great necessity the 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 president of Greenwood. So I've known him for a very long time, uh, and he's done a fantastic job of taking that cemetery into the 21st century. They have a whole section set aside so the Chinese can burn their uh, their money after their ceremonies. Um, he's he has done a set of really quite stunning artistic involvements. But I gotta say, you know, there's this place right next to Oakwood. Uh, what is it called? Syracuse University, right. that has this big dramatic arts programs. Uh, you know, to me, this is Oakwood is just like filled of great places to do stuff, mm -hmm. right? New sculpture, uh, new dance, new. Uh, I mean, just a lot of theater. You could imagine that's Chapin, on those Chapin steps, in my time. I saw at least 25 people taking wedding pictures, mm -hmm. right? How could you not do a play on the Chapin steps? I mean, it just it seems like an obvious place to do it. And so I think you have to be imaginative and step outside the box right. to this happen. Although I do believe the one thing that Oakwood, in its tradition and in its way, it should definitely get involved in uh, natural burial. Yeah, I agree. I agree. There are a few more questions if you have just a couple more minutes. I got time. Um, so uh, someone wants to know if you know when Morningside was established and by what organization. Do you know? Uh, you know, I, I don't know off the top of my head. <laughs> it was early 20th century. Uh, I think it was like 1900 something. Uh, they were founded as a nonprofit just like Oakwood. Uh, they were not a private cemetery. Uh, and so they were, uh, so what happened to my, my morning time, and this is, you'd have to check the records to make sure, but my sense is that it gradually became difficult to maintain it mm -hmm. based upon the number of burials that they were having. Mm -hmm. And so they turned to the Oakwood board as early as the 1960s. And by the 1970s, I think it's 75, 76, they're actually incorporated into Oakwood Morningside uh, Inc. where they're one cemetery. Uh, but uh, it was a really, uh, even when I was a real young kid, uh, Morningside was already being managed by my dad uh, from certainly in the 60s. Um. Someone from uh, Hakpa wants to know what your favorite tombstone in Oakwood is or monument. Uh, and so I, I have, it's impossible to pick one. I, I just spent way too much time there. Um, I actually do love the L.C. Smith mausoleum. It's, it's, just a, a, it's just a gorgeous space and that Tiffany is stunning. I am a fan of Elias W. Leavenworth, who gave me the title for my first book. So uh, I do like his. Uh, as a kid, I was completely obsessed with the Longstreet Pyramid, which just seemed like, how could, they, how could you build one of these in a cemetery? I just thought it was the coolest thing ever. Uh, and there are, and then um, the Niven Angel really is in person. I, I, that's a really nice photograph of it. But in person, it's it's a gorgeous piece, uh, and I love the places where you have those small sculptures that that are integrated into the stone. Uh, you know, there's just so many of them that are so beautiful. It's really a pleasure to be there. So it's hard. It's really hard, actually. <laughs> I gotta say. <laughs> and that's the thing is that I think just as they might do. Um, uh, you know, historical walks or tours, these ghost tours, they should do art tours. Oh, just, without a doubt. Just like our faculty at ESF, they do, you know, tree tours, yeah. you know, things like that, that there just needs to be more 
um, you know, ways of looking at the cemetery, different lenses through which you could look at and, and, and talk about. I will say, as a kid, uh, my sort of life sort of ended at the Belden Steps, those mm -hmm. beautiful set of steps that go up uh, to, I think it's the Foreman grave. And those, I just thought they were the coolest thing. I mean, we did everything on that uh, that we could think of. We climbed all over them. We paint, you know, we just tried to figure out what we could, games we could play with them, hide and seek and all sorts, jump off them. Mm -hmm. And I just thought they were, they're gorgeously constructed. That's not an easy thing to do to carve that up like that. And so it's a beautifully done thing. Um, one more question here, uh, which is, do you remember if the open area across from the office is where Phil from the 81 construction project was dumped? Uh, was, I don't think so. I think they trucked it out. Uh, all the fill. I don't think they put that dirt that's there now in front behind the gate. I think that came later, but I could be wrong. I, you know, I was 10. I didn't really spend a lot of time hanging out with the construction guys. <laughs> well, I have to tell you, you have a lot of uh, messages here of thanks and appreciation. People really grateful for your talk. And I really appreciate you spending this time with us and also just sharing all of these personal stories and memories in addition to all of your knowledge on this topic, which is phenomenal just phenomenal. So again, I'd love to recommend everyone read these books. The Last Great Necessity, Is the Cemetery Dead? Although Medicine Moves to the Mall is also cool. Well, thank you. It's one of my favorites too. <laughs> really great. Thank you very much for your talk. I really appreciate it. It's just wonderful. It's really, it's really a pleasure to do. Uh, thank you. Thank you all for coming. Uh, and I hope that it, it was of service to Hakva and the other P in the ESF. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wish you all good luck. And if I can do something, I'd be happy to do it. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. And just for everyone who's still on the line, we have two more talks. Uh, April 8th and May 6th. And again, thanks to the Center for Cultural Landscape Preservation. Thanks to the Friends of Oakwood. And uh, thanks to the Department of Landscape Architecture. Um, really, really appreciate it. So that would be it. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Good night.